Good to see all of you. Good to be with all of you. Happy to always be with my, my family here in Pasadena. Let's have a word of prayer before we, we begin this morning. Lord God, we are thankful for the chance to worship you this morning. We are thankful for the chance to, the privilege to open your holy word. Lord, the message that, that you have left for us, the words in which we believe you are revealed to us. So Lord, this morning as we explore your word, my prayer is that your spirit would speak to our hearts and to our minds, Lord, that you would use your word to shape and form who we are in this world that we live in, in a world where so many things vie for our attention, where so many things shape who we are, shape what we believe. Lord, we pray that your word would be that shaping tool for us this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, this week we are beginning a new series on the book of Exodus that I'm very excited about, uh, that I am very excited to spend these next few weeks together exploring uh, this beautiful book of the Bible, because Exodus is a book of the Bible that for many people for a very long time has been incredibly important uh, because of the theology that it presents because of the stories that it presents, because of the situations that, that it addresses. In this book of Exodus, you find the first Passover, an event of, of crucial importance to our Jewish friends, as well as an event, uh, an event that plays prominently into the Christian story as we read about the death of Jesus and the events surrounding it. In this book of Exodus, you find the Ten Commandments, Something of, of uh, enormous importance within Christianity, but so, something of an identity maker for those of us in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. You find the story of the golden calf. You find the story of God's covenant with his people. You find the beginnings of a, a formalized religion between God and his people. So many central tenets of what we believe about God, of what we believe about ourselves, of what we believe about faith are rooted in what we find here in this book of Exodus. And this is a good thing. This is a beautiful thing that, that we will continue to stumble upon as we explore this book together over, over the next few weeks. But for all of the good and for all of the meaning that we find in the book of Exodus, I think that there is an enormous part an enormous part of this book of Exodus, an enormous part of the story that it tells, an enormous part of this journey with God that we all experience, that we miss here in this portion of the Bible. Because of the shape of religion, spirituality, the journey of faith, the, the shape that all of those things have taken for the world that we live in today. We're in the world that we live in, in the western part of the world, in the 21st century. Often when we talk about our religion, or maybe a more accurate way to say it, often when we talk about our spirituality, what we're actually talking about is just that. Spirituality. Something that when you think about it, I say the word spirituality and you think about what comes to mind when I mention that word. Maybe something sort of nebulous. Maybe something a, a little bit ambiguous, something that kind of goes beyond the physical that doesn't really exist that much in a physical form. And often, the way that we describe spirituality in the part of the world that we live in, in the culture of the world that we live in, spirituality is quite simply, the way we define it anyway, something that happens between me as a person and God. That it's just the two of us on this journey. That the shape that it comes to take in my life, the things that it leads me to do, the beliefs that it leads me to have are between God and myself. To the point that when somebody questions our spirituality, or even when we take it upon ourselves to question somebody else's spirituality, there's immediately some pushback there because the response is, you cannot judge what happens between God and me because we view this as a journey that is simply between the two of us. 
And in this journey between the two of us, in this journey between God and me, we often relate to one another, God and me, in this relationship, in a way that when you think about it, transcends or in any sort of physical categories, right? The ways that we relate to God through faith, where faith is believing in things that are true about this God and the way that he relates to me. We relate to God through concepts, right? Through the gospel, through grace, through mercy. We relate to God through confidence in where we're going, right? A good place in the end rather than a not so good place in the end. And then finally, the ultimate kind of relation with God, at least in the way that we would describe it as spirituality, it mainly happens on an internal level. That my communication with God is something that happens within me, right? That when God communicates to me, it's within me. When I communicate with God, it's within me. In other words, what I'm trying to say, our experience of God and life lived with God in the world that we live in happens usually on what I would call a metaphysical level. That is a level that transcends the physical, that you cannot describe in terms of physicality. It's internal. It doesn't take shape or form other than the shape or form that you and I take. And certainly these are good things. Don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not knocking any of these things or calling them inappropriate in any way. Faith, the gospel, belief in final resolution for humanity. These are good and beautiful parts of what it means to be a Christian. I believe in them wholeheartedly. But the book of Exodus confronts us with a problem. It confronts this way of thinking immediately within the text. Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Let me make sure I have this on. Exodus 1, 13 and 14. The very beginning of this story says, So they, that is the Egyptians, ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all of their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And here's the question. What does faith, what does spirituality that often takes a metaphysical form do when it is confronted by the harsh realities, the real, physical realities of the world that we live in. What does faith, what does religion, what does spirituality, here in the beginning of the book of Exodus, what does it look like when a person meets the harsh reality of slavery. Often in our own world, when we're confronted with the real physical problems that it brings, we often talk about people needing the gospel. That if there is a problem of physicality, whether it's with law, whether it's with people groups, whether it's with anything that goes on in our world, often the Christian response, the very easy response that we reach to is, well, that group of people, whoever they may be, simply need the gospel. And absolutely, I agree with that. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I think everyone needs the good news of the kingdom of God. It is the purpose of the Christian movement to experience the kingdom ourselves and to pass it on to others. But stop and think about the phrase that we respond for with a moment. When we encounter a physical uh, problem in the world and we say, well, that group of people, whoever's going through it, whatever they're experiencing with it, whatever the cause of it, they just need the gospel. Analyze that statement for a moment. Stop and think about it. The most common Christian response to the real problems of the physical world that we live in is to respond to a physical problem with a non-physical solution. 
something that kind of asserts that we see something spiritual, nebulous, non-physical as the response to the physical problems that our world presents to us. And that sometimes, maybe sometimes, there is a gap between what we see as the problem and what we see as the fitting response. So as a result of all of that, we begin to see everything around us as spiritual, as beyond the physical, as something that is purely on this spiritual, nebulous sort of level. But what I think the text of Exodus immediately does, in the very beginning of the story, it strikes us with the real physical realities of the world around us. The Egyptians in the story certainly perceived the, the world this way. Verses 10 and 11 of Exodus chapter 1, where the, the, the Egyptians say, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, talking about the Israelites, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land, and therefore they set taskmasters over, or, or therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. The Egyptians immediately realize that these Israelites, who, by the way, are experiencing the fulfillment of the promises that God made to Abraham. All the way back in the book of Genesis, when God tells Abraham, a man who he and his wife are beyond childbearing age, God comes and tells him, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. This book of Exodus opens with the Israelites reproducing and reproducing and reproducing and reproducing to the point that they become a great nation. This is more than humanity just doing what humanity does. This is the fulfillment of God's promises. In the very beginning of the book of Exodus, it begins with this message that God's promises to His people are being fulfilled. They are becoming a great nation, and the Egyptians are starting to notice. The Egyptians notice that these Israelites, non-Egyptians who live in our land, are growing and growing and growing and growing to the point that they are becoming a threat to us. Now notice, that is not a spiritual concern. That is a real, physical, concrete concern. What if they become greater than we are? What if they overthrow us and we have to live according to their ways? What if their culture begins to replace our culture? A very sad echo of phrases that we still throw around today. And so the Egyptians answer a physical problem with another physical problem, right? There is nothing spiritual going on here. There is no level of non-physical spirituality happening here. Go back to the original verses we started with, verses 13 and 14. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. The Egyptians look at the physical, concrete threat that they think is posed to them. And they do not respond in any sort of spiritual way. They respond with real, physical slavery. Not spiritual slavery. Not the idea that there is the possibility of some sort of bad thing that could happen, but with real Slavery. Slavery that has a real cost for real people, as we see in the next few verses. Verses 15 and 16. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, 
When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. It does not get much more physical or concrete than this. You have a group of people, God's chosen people, forced into slavery that has real consequences, not only for them, but for their children, for their possibility of even remaining a people, to have children that will continue to carry on their identity. This is not a spiritual crisis of any kind. This is the harsh reality of the real world confronting real people who live in this world. They don't need a change of perspective. They don't need a new attitude. They don't need to be too blessed to be stressed. That's the stuff we throw around, right? What these people need is a very real response to their very real slavery. They need a miraculous intervention that will actually physically change their physical circumstances in which they suffer. Not a new perspective, not a new mindset. They need God to come and act concretely. And so the narrative continues on. The story goes on from this point. You have these two Hebrew midwives who do not do what Pharaoh commands them to do. So because of that, Pharaoh takes drastic measures, says that every newborn Hebrew son should be thrown into the Nile River. But one of these sons, a baby by the name of Moses, comes to Pharaoh's daughter in a basket on the Nile River, which when you think about it for a moment, this is an act of faithful resistance on the part of his parents, right? The Pharaoh said, throw your sons into the Nile. Moses' parents do put their son into the Nile, but in a basket, in a way that will preserve his life. And this Moses grows, knowing that he's a Hebrew, being raised by his own mother, but living in the courts of the Egyptians, being raised as a member of the royal family. But something that we don't often see, all throughout this narrative... The story, from the time that Israel enters into slavery, in Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 13, all the way until when Moses becomes an adult, there are two themes running through this story that we often don't see. And I would argue that we don't see these themes because they don't sit well with us. So maybe we choose not to see these themes. The first of which is, there is absolutely no appeal to God on the part of the people. Absolutely none. In fact, the only mention of God in this story, up to Exodus chapter 2, is when it says that the two Hebrew midwives refused to kill the Hebrew sons because they feared God. But there is no appeal to God in the midst of the circumstances of slavery. And secondly, when it comes to their situation, when it comes to their dealings with the Egyptians where they've become slaves, the Israelites are silent. They say absolutely nothing. The Hebrew midwives silently carry out their duty to preserve the lives of Hebrew sons, but they don't say much. Moses' mother, even though she's mentioned as raising him, as participating in this act of faithful resistance to save his life, she says nothing in this opening narrative. 
As the narrative kind of progresses till Moses becomes an adult, Moses kills an Egyptian because the Egyptian is attacking a Hebrew slave who, by the way, is suffering silently while he's being attacked. In other words, in the midst of this narrative of slavery, of suffering, of the horrific life that slavery brings with it, the Israelites make no appeal to God and their suffering is silent. Invisible to everybody except those who are suffering and those who are imposing the suffering. And that detail is often very troubling to us. That those who would suffer so greatly would do so in silence, but would also do so without any appeal to God, especially because they are the chosen people of God, right? And dare I say that this is a detail that still bothers us today because in the midst of much suffering that still happens today, there is still silence. There are racial groups that continually suffer under the cancer of racism. Only in recent months has it kind of come to the the national forefront that the Asian community has been suffering in silence as they have experienced horrific racism over the past year. There are some people who suffer silently with struggles with health. There are some people who suffer silently in domestic situations. There are some people who suffer silently with their mental health. There is suffering in the world that we live in today, and it often happens in silence. And if we're being honest, it is a silence that is often bothersome to those of us on the outside of some of those situations, to the point that we implore the people we know who are going going through those situations, we implore them not to be silent. And we take it upon ourselves to tell them what they should be doing. Maybe you've heard this said to yourself, or maybe if you're like me, you've even said it in some situations and then realized you said it after the situation was over. Where you go to somebody, you say, hey, if that was happening in my community, I would definitely do this. I don't know why you aren't doing it. If this was happening to my health, I would go this place, this place, and this place and see that doctor and that person there. If that was happening in my home, I would do all of these different things. All of that to make the point that I think silence on the part of those who are suffering is often bothersome to those of us who are not suffering. And the silence on behalf of the Hebrew slaves bothers us. Why do they not call out to God? Why do the chosen people of God, the chosen nation of God, we sang in the hymn this morning, ye seed of Israel's chosen race. Why do they not call out to God in the midst of their suffering? Why do they not at the very minimum resist their Egyptian overlords in some way? And all of this silence, all of this suffering builds up through the entire narrative until it finally gets to a point where it cannot be held down anymore. And it releases in this one particular verse in Exodus where you almost hear the desperation behind the text. Exodus chapter 2 verse 23 says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. And their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. This verse 
carries the weight of it. You almost hear the cry of desperation behind the verse. It carries a weight of something that has been buried, something that has been repressed for a long time that simply cannot be buried or repressed any longer. It's one of those things that just erupts because it has been pushed down time and time and time again, and it cannot be pushed down any longer. We don't know why it took them this long to cry out to God. We don't know why it took them this long to break their silence. But when they finally did, what we see is just a small bit of the desperation that comes from their cry. But what follows, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful paradigm-setting texts in the entire Bible. Verse 25 of Exodus chapter 2. God saw the people of Israel. And God knew. They have been silent. But God had seen them. They kept their suffering to themselves. But God knew. This is not a God who is beyond the physical, floating away as a spirit on a cloud somewhere, content to be in his good place that hopefully if we're good enough, we'll be there one day with him. This is a God who is intimately familiar with human suffering. It is not beyond him. It is not too little for him. And it is not something that he ignores. In fact, all throughout Scripture, this is a paradigm-setting text because all throughout Scripture, people crying out to God and God hearing them is something you find over and over and over again. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about a widow who is continually denied justice. And Jesus finishes that parable by giving us the main point of why he's telling it. And he tells his disciples, he says, Will not God give justice to those who cry out to him? You go to the end of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 6. You have the image of those who have been killed for the sake of the faith under the altar in heaven crying out to God. And it uses that word. They cry out to God asking how long their deaths would be meaningless before God would vindicate them. All throughout Scripture, you have this paradigm of people crying out to God and doing, and God doing what He does here in the book of Exodus. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. What the Bible reveals to us is that this is a God who is not beyond the physical realities of what happen in our, happens in our world. The writer of Exodus so poetically, beautifully tells us this truth that we can still cling on to today. God sees and God knows. For people groups who suffer under the oppression of other people groups in our world. God sees and God knows. For people suffering with things in life that are beyond their control. Health. Situations of injustice. Situations in which we feel powerless. God sees and God knows knows. The suffering that you and I find ourselves in sometimes is a result of ourselves. Sometimes from the result of other people. Sometimes simply as a result of living in the world that we live in. When we find ourselves in those situations, God sees and God knows. And the truth is, many of us may find ourselves in these situations this morning. The world that we live in finds itself 
in numerous situations where people are hurting. I received a message this morning from a good friend, a friend who was actually supposed to preach for us a few weeks ago and was not able to, so Rick Layton stood in and, and preached for him. I got a message from him this morning that his father died in Brazil from complications of COVID. As have 550,000 other people in the United States alone. The world hurts this morning. We hurt this morning. There are many of us who are hurting right now because of so many situations. Maybe you know of, as I know of, situations of injustice where we know that there are people being harmed and we can do absolutely nothing about it. Maybe there are health situations where there is heartbreak and unanswered questions. And here is the truth that I am trying to express to you this morning. This is what I believe the Bible testifies to. This is the God that I believe it reveals. We do not worship a God who remains separated from these problems. We do not worship a God who sees spiritual, nebulous, non-physical answers to the physical problems we experience. We worship a God who deals with the physical world that we live in in a physical way. A physical world where people in the midst of slavery can cry out to God and the Bible expresses the simple truth to us. God sees and God knows. And God saw and God knew before they cried out to him. But it's when they cried out to him that God steps in and reminds them, I haven't gone anywhere. The reason that you are continuing to grow great as a nation is because I've been here fulfilling the promises that I made to Abraham. Promises that now belong to you because you are Abraham's family. When Pharaoh told you to throw your sons into the Nile, by the way, one of those sons that was thrown into the Nile, I will use to lead you out of slavery. The people cried out to God, and God's response was, I see, and I know, and I haven't gone anywhere. Amen. Wherever you are this morning, whatever you're experiencing this morning, whatever life has thrown at you this morning, what I want to leave you with is simply this. God sees, and God knows.